Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my lecture series for my class ES369N, Sustainability Issues in Energy. Today, we're beginning Unit 2, in which we'll cover carbon capture, utilization, and storage, also known as CCUS. If you've been enjoying these lectures, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. I hope that you've been finding these informative and helpful in understanding some of the challenges we're facing uh, moving forward with sustainable energy. So in this lecture, I'm going to cover the basics of the carbon cycle so we can better understand how the Earth cycles carbon around in different forms and how energy fits in with that. The recommended reading for this unit on CCUS is only one book that I've found to be quite, uh, quite informative. It's by Smit and uh, uh, several co-authors, and it's called Introduction to Carbon Capture and Sequestration. It's uh, easily available um, from your local uh, library or from uh, uh, Imperial College Press, but I highly recommend this. So to set the stage here, again, I covered this in uh, the second lecture of this series, but it's well understood that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps heat and causes the Earth's surface temperature to rise as the CO2 concentration increases. So here's a plot using uh, uh, NOAA data and um, other different sources here. We've got um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration here. This is the gray line corresponding to the right-hand y-axis. And then on the left-hand x-axis, we have the difference from the 20th century average global surface temperature in degrees Celsius. And so years that are coded blue are below that average and years that are red are above that average. And you can see that we've been above average since the late 1970s and the trend uh, continues upward with some variation from year to year, but that's the overall trend. So the problem is as we keep putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the surface temperature is going to warm with a lot of unpredictable consequences as far as the climate goes. So the challenge then is uh, if we want to keep using fossil fuels as an energy resource, which I would argue we probably do, and most projections say that we are going to continue to do so, we need to have some way of mitigating the carbon emissions associated with that. So there are a couple of choices here. We can start out by capturing the carbon either from the atmosphere or from its point of generation, like a power plant. And then, the choice is we can use either use it for something like for making things or we can store it somewhere and so that's ccus carbon capture utilization and storage so we'll go through each one of these one by one let's start off by talking about the carbon cycle so naturally on earth carbon in various chemical forms is constantly moving around through between different reservoirs using different pathways so reservoirs are going to be defined as the components of the cycle that hold carbon. And fluxes are the rates of carbon transfer between reservoirs, OK? So we've got, we've got reservoirs and we've got fluxes. And so the you know, natural equi equilibrium dictates that if an excess of carbon builds up in one reservoir, the other reservoirs and fluxes between them will adjust. And how this adjustment happens, by which pathways and how, um, you know, how quickly is important to understanding the overall carbon balance on Earth. Okay, so here's a good illustration from the US Department of Energy of reservoirs and fluxes. So they divide this into land and ocean. So on land, we have carbon going into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. Um, it's taken up from the atmosphere by photosynthesis. Um, some plant respiration results in a net re release of carbon dioxide, um, but then the carbon that's sequestered in the plants goes into the soil when the biomass um, uh, go, go, becomes part of the soil, and then decomposition releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere again. Um, on the ocean, there's an equilibrium between atmospheric CO2 and dissolved CO2 in the ocean, which is mediated by photosynthesis of uh, driven by marine organisms, decomposition and burial, and then eventual burial to uh, the ocean sediment. So that's kind of the land versus sea version of the carbon cycle. 
Now we can think about this a little more directly in terms of reservoirs and fluxes. So here is um, another diagram where we've got the reservoirs um, uh, shown in blue text. So we've got the atmosphere, soil, fossil fuels, uh, the Earth's crust, and then the ocean, which is divided by surface ocean, and then the intermediate to deep ocean, as well as plants. And then all the fluxes here are represented in red. So everything from burning fossil fuels to photosynthesis and ocean uptake, ocean loss, those are all part of the overall carbon cycle. So it's pretty complicated. Um, the ones that I want to point out here are uh, burning fossil fuels and then deforestation and land use change. These are the major ones that uh, human activity influences. And you can see that obviously compared to some of the other fluxes that are here, you know, if we add these together, burning fossil fuels, 7.7 .7 petagrams of carbon per year, uh, deforestation, land use change. 1.1 petagrams per year net to the atmosphere. It is considerably slower than some of these other um, fluxes, like the ocean exchange, um, you know, plant respiration, photosynthesis. So it's a lot smaller. But the key here, and this is what I mentioned earlier, is that it uh, this the changes in these fluxes are occurring over much shorter time scales than the other fluxes and reservoirs can um, adjust to accommodate it. And this is what's causing some of the problems. Okay, now I want to talk about some of the reservoirs that we have that can be potential carbon storage locations. And the two that I really want to focus on are Earth's crust and the ocean, because by far these are um, the two largest potential reservoirs that could be used to store carbon. Okay, so we're going to move forward talking about these. So first we're going to talk about the ocean and how carbon is stored in the ocean um, and what the implications are. Okay, so carbon in the ocean. Here's a very simplified uh, drawing of the ocean and the atmosphere. So um, the atmosphere contains carbon dioxide in its gaseous form, so that's CO2G, and the ocean contains dissolved CO2, so this is aqueous CO2. And um, the amount of CO2 dissolved in the ocean uh, constantly adjusts itself so that, it, that is in equilibrium with the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere, okay? And so CO2 is constantly moving back and forth across the, uh, the air-sea boundary. So we can write this equation here that we've got constant exchange between the gas phase and the aqueous phase. Now, what happens when you dissolve CO2 in water is that the carbon dioxide molecule dissociates and reacts with the water. And so we can form a couple of different dissolved ionic species. Um, we can form this um, uh, anion here, which is called the bicarbonate anion. And so that's just um, the water decomposes to uh, a hydrogen um, anion, or excuse me, hydrogen cation. And then the other hydrogen and the oxygen get stuck into the uh, bicarbonate here. We can further react this bicarbonate with more hydrogen to produce a carbonate ion uh, plus two more um, hydrogen cations. And um, these reactions occur at different pH levels, okay? So um, the second reaction here, it requires um, more uh, H plus to be produced. And so th this reaction is gonna be suppressed when there's already a lot of aqueous H plus in the water. And so if you have relatively less H plus in the water, that corresponds to a higher pH, right? And so um, the carbonate ion is favored at higher pHs, whereas the bicarbonate ion is favored at relatively lower pHs. And this diagram here shows you roughly what the pH levels are where these different species are present. So this is pH on the x-axis, and this is the logarithm of the aqueous concentration. So it's the logarithm of moles per kilogram. Um, so you can see that for pHs above about nine, you're basically gonna be entirely uh, with the carbonate ion. For intermediate pHs, eight and slightly lower than that, bicarbonate is favored. And then at very acidic pHs, actually the uh, CO2 will not dissociate or react with water. It'll just remain as a CO2. And just for comparison, um, here's the H plus concentration. Obviously that varies, uh, the logarithm of that varies uh, linearly with pH as does the OH minus, okay? 
Um, surface ocean pH is slightly above eight. And so you can see that at least for the surface ocean, um, bicarbonate um, outnumbers carbonate by roughly a factor of 10. So it's almost an entire uh, log cycle. Okay, so we've got this dissolved, uh, these dissolved carbon species in the ocean. So what do we do with them? Well, biological processes can act to sequester the carbon. So there's many different organisms that use um, dissolved carbonate ion to uh, build their skeletons or for, for other purposes. So a great example of this is coral. You know, coral builds its skeleton out of carbonate ion. Um, Coccolithophorids and foraminifera are two um, you know, types of marine microorganisms that also have carbonate skeletons. And then benth benthic algae also uses um, carbonate ions in its structure. We can also use dissolved organic carbon. And so this is not going to be things that result from having you know, CO2 dissolved in the water. But if you have other sources of organic carbon, like input from rivers or you know, decaying organic matter or that sort of thing, you're going to produce these you know, organic acids, that sort of thing that can be dissolved in water. And this can be taken up by phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, that sort of thing, which will end up sequestering the carbon in the ocean. These organisms die and their skeletons um, or other types of organic matter will um, sink to the bottom of the ocean and can be buried. Okay, so the ocean is a huge potential reservoir for, uh, for CO2. So, you know what, let's just pump all the CO2 into the ocean. It can take all of it. We, it can hold way more CO2 than we currently have in the atmosphere. Well, okay, not so fast. Um, you know, just in the same way that the pH controls the dissolved phases, the different dissolved phases can also control the pH. Okay, so if I pump more and more dissolved CO2 into the ocean, what's going to happen is I'm going to reduce the pH of the water. And when I reduce the pH, I'm going to change what dissolved species are preferentially present. So I mentioned earlier that at our typical surface ocean pH, we've got about, uh, you know, minus 3.5 log concentration of the carbonate ion, which is what corals and coccoliths and that sort of thing use for the skeletons. If I reduce the pH even by a little bit, you know, I can reduce the abundance of carbonate ion in the water by a factor of 10. And this is really bad because number one, those critters don't have the necessary ions to build their skeletons. You can also, you can actually start dissolving the skeletons of existing critters. Um, so we call this ocean acidification and we know that this is a problem. So we don't wanna rely on the ocean for too much CO2 storage because it would have some very significant biological uh, consequences. Okay, so to summarize carbon storage in the ocean, we can store it in two ways, either as dissolved phases or as precipitated phases. So this is, you know, carbonate skeletons, organic matter, that sort of thing. Um, if we increase the dissolved CO2 concentration, we will we decrease the pH of the water, we acidify the ocean. And this has bad implications for the critters that make their shells out of calcium carbonate, for instance. Um, now, if the precipitated phases are buried, then that carbon becomes of the part of the crustal reservoir of carbon. So I want to talk about this a little bit because there's a lot of different ways that you can store carbon in the Earth's crust. So first of all, let's define what the crust is. So the crust is the outermost layer of the Earth, and it's typically made up of lighter silicate minerals like quartz and feldspars. So if we take a cross section of the Earth, the Earth is stratified into different layers. We've got the inner core in the middle, and then the outer core, which is the next layer out, that's going to be a, a liquid, mostly nickel and iron. And then above that, we've got the mantle. Uh, the mantle is very thick. Um, we'll talk about its mineralogical composition in a little while. But the crust is just the very, very, very top outer layer there. And um, we've got two different kinds of crust. We've got continental crust, which is what the continents are made up of. Um, this is typically lighter minerals. And then we have oceanic crust again, which is slightly heavier minerals, um, which, uh, you know, as you, might, um, as you might guess, is present beneath the oceans, okay? So this is really what we're talking about. We're talking about either continental crust or oceanic crust. 
Carbon can exist in the crust as a dissolved phase in other crustal fluids. So it can be dissolved in brine, just the same way it gets dissolved in water. Uh, you can also dissolve carbon dioxide in some oils. Um, so that's another way of storing it. You can store it as a discrete fluid phase, um, gaseous CO2 or liquid or supercritical CO2. The exact phase depends on the temperature and pressure. We'll get into that um, uh, later on in this, uh, in this unit. Um, we can store carbon as an adsorbed phase stuck on the surfaces of various minerals or in coal. It's a really great, great way to store carbon dioxide is in um, unminable coal seams. Or we can um, store carbon as a, as a mineralized phase. We can use it to precipitate new minerals in the subsurface. So I want to talk a little bit about weathering because this is a way, a natural way of drawing down CO2 out of the atmosphere. Okay, so let's imagine we've got um, a continent here and then an ocean, and our continent is made up of silicate rocks. This is a really generic silicate mineral here, some combination of calcium, silicon, and oxygen. Okay, so we've got CO2 in the atmosphere. When it rains, what happens is the CO2 in the atmosphere combines with the water in the rainwater, and uh, it forms carbonic acid, which then you know, dissociates into H plus and uh, bicarbonate ions, just the way we've talked about before. And this acid will react with certain silicate minerals in the crust, and they will release um, the uh, alkaline um, or alkaline earth metal cations. So this can be calcium, magnesium, sodium, that sort of thing and then um, a bicarbonate, um, bicarbonate ion. That then can go into the ocean and then be sequestered. So um, silicate weathering is a really great way of, um, the, you know, the Earth's way of, of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, eventually, the bicarbonate reacts with, you know, stuff in the ocean through biological processes to make calcium carbonate, and uh, this eventually is buried beneath the seafloor. So, the, um, the CO2 ends up being sequestered in the crust in this way, okay? So let's talk a little more about the chemistry involved here. So first off, the CO2 mixes with the rainwater. We've already seen this reaction. And so we produce bicarbonate plus um, two hydrogen cations. And it's the, uh, the hydrogen cations that really react with the silicate minerals um, to um, hydrate the, um, the mineral and the, uh, release uh, the cations that are present. So um, if we take um, a typical silicate mineral, this is plagioclase feldspar, it's uh, an alumina silicate with a calcium stuck on it and react it with those two hydrogen cations plus more water, then what we end up with is a liberated calcium cation. And then this new mineral, this is called kaolinite and it's a, it's a clay. So we take the feldspar, we, we react it with the hydrogen and water and we generate calcium plus um, kaolinite. And then what happens is that the liberated cations, they can be uh, calcium, magnesium, sodium, lithium, stuff like that, reacts with the bicarbonate um, ions to make uh, calcium carbonate, which is what corals and foram shells and that sort of thing are made of. Okay. Now, um, over geologic time, the silicate weathering process adjusts to buffer changes in atmospheric CO2. So when, uh, if you think about volcanoes being a great natural source of atmospheric CO2 over geologic time, what happens is that if you have periods of enhanced volcanic activity, you'll typically build up carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will um, increase the surface temperature, increase the amounts of rain and the amount of weathering that you get, so you get more rain falling, and this weathers the silicate minerals and draws CO2 out of the atmosphere where it goes into the ocean and eventually is sequestered, okay? Um, in contrast, if you have uh, periods of lower atmospheric CO2, the rate of weathering decreases and allows the atmospheric CO2 uh, to build up, okay? So this is sensitive over geologic time to plate tectonics and volcanic activity and that sort of thing. OK, the key here is geologic time. OK, we can't rely on this to draw down the amount of CO2 we've put into the atmosphere anytime soon. OK, this takes millions of years. So um, 
we can mineralize carbon in the crust, right? So I just said we can bury calcium carbonate. And you know that's a great way of sequestering the carbon in the crust. We can also mineralize um, um, carbon carbon dioxide if you have dissolved CO2 in you know pore fluid in the subsurface. You can react with different minerals that are present to produce new minerals. Um, so these are just some example reactions. You can react CO2 with um, wollastonite to um, produce calcium carbonate here. This obviously kicks out a, a silica ion. Um, you can react olivine, which is a very uh, common mineral in um, oceanic crust with carbon dioxide to produce um, dolomite plus quartz or plus silica. Anorthite, we uh, just talked about this. It's a type of uh, plagioclase feldspar, produces kaolinite plus calcium carbonate. Albite, which is a sodium feldspar, will produce um, this mineral here. It's similar to kaolinite. It's also another hydrated alumina silica. This is called dawsonite plus more silica. And then uh, peroxine, I just wrote kind of a generic peroxine formula here, uh, can produce either uh, calcium carbonate or dolomite plus more silica. So this is just you know, several of, of many different um, reaction pathways you can have to take CO2 either dissolved or as a discrete fluid phase in the subsurface and actually turn it into a mineral. Now, these reactions happen over widely different uh, time scales. Okay, so we're looking at dissolution rates here. So you can think of this the rate at which these, um, these minerals dissolve and reprecipitate. So our feldspars are down here. They're quite slow. You know, there's a wide range depending on the chemistry of the feldspar, albite versus anorthite. Um, this is a Labradorite in the middle. Um, asbestos will react, but it's also very slow. Olivine is somewhere in the middle. And then these two minerals up here, well, astonite and brucite, will react considerably faster. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to do this maybe as a man made process, you want to look at well, astonite or brucite um, for your sequestration. So, um, I want to talk specifically about. CO2 mineralization in basalts and mantled rocks, okay? So um, basalt is an extrusive igneous rock, which means that it is erupted from a volcano. And it's mainly composed of plagioclase feldspar, pyroxene, and some amount of olivine. And this is what a lot of the oceanic crust um, is made up of. So if we look at the composition of basalt here on this uh, QP, uh, Q, excuse me, QAPF, uh, diagram. This is a way of representing igneous rocks based on their composition in terms of how much quartz, plagioclase versus alkali feldspar they have, and then feldspathoids, which are these weird um, feldspar-like minerals that have low silica content. Okay, So basalt and um, andesite, which is also a very closely related mineral, um, they plot right in the middle here between the, the quartz and the feldspathoids, and they're heavily weighted towards the uh, plagioclase um, end of the spectrum. And um, generally, your volcanoes that are tapping reservoirs of molten oceanic crust um, or mantle um, are going to be erupting basalt. So here's a great uh, photograph of a volcano in Iceland, obviously right in the middle of the ocean. Uh, it's on top of a hot spot on top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So um, there's a lot of melted mantle and oceanic crust going into that. OK, so that's basalt coming out there. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit about the mantle. So if you look at what goes on at a mid-ocean ridge, so this is in the middle of the ocean where two tectonic plates are spreading apart. And what happens there is that the mantle actually um, comes up almost to the surface and um, it melts. This is a eutectic melting because we're melting an assemblage of minerals, okay? And it melts and it produces new oceanic crust here. And gradually, um, the crust spreads away from the mid-ocean mid ridge as more crust is created. Um, and so the mantle is, is also made up of silicate minerals with a lot of magnesium and iron. So the minerals that are here in the, uh, the mantle are typically olivine, pyroxenes, and various aluminum silicates, including plagioclase feldspar, spinel, and garnet. Uh, the composition changes a little bit with depth. Um, you know, below this 1300 degrees Celsius isotherm, you're looking at olivine and peroxine, uh, which um, mainly make up this uh, peridotite rock. Um, this is the asthenospheric mantle. So this is the mantle that deforms plastically by creep. Um, 
once you get um, above that 1300 degree isotherm, um, you're more weighted towards olivine and orthoperoxine. So this is Hartsburgite, and this is what we call the lithospheric mantle. So it deforms brittily rather um, than, than by creep. Um, and then once we get above the Mohorovitch discontinuity, somewhere between seven and 10 kilometers depth, this is what separates the crust from the mantle. And then the oceanic crust is mostly plagioclase and clinoperoxine with small amounts of olivine. And again, this is basalt or gabbro, which is its intrusive equivalent. And the oceanic crust is typically five to seven kilometers thick. And then you'll have some sediments deposited on top of that with, you know, again, with carbon that's been sequestered out of the, um, out of the water column. Okay, so there's um, interesting things that can happen here. Hydrothermal alteration is a way of reacting these rocks with water and CO2 to produce interesting mineral phases. Um, there's also just going to be natural reactions as water moves around and percolates through these rocks over geologic time. So here are some examples of mantle rocks that have uh, CO2 mineralization. There's a really great exposure of an ophiolite complex, which is um, some exposed mantle rocks um, in Oman, which uh, I've actually had the pleasure of visiting there a long time ago. Um, but here you can see we've got a layer of um, hydrated peridotite sandwiched between carbonated peridotite. So, um, you know, we've got some, you know, carbonated reactions here. You can see these, these veins here, these, these carbonate, carbonated minerals. Um, in this, uh, in this image. Here's some other great um, examples of these minerals that form by reacting mantle rocks with CO2 and water. Okay, so to summarize, carbon in the crust. Um, naturally, silicate weathering takes atmospheric CO2 and turns it into carbonate minerals, which then enter the ocean and get buried directly into the sediments and uh, or they get used by marine critters before being buried. And we can also react um, mantle rocks and basalts readily with CO2 rich fluids. And these precipitate what we call orthogenic minerals because they're made, they're made in situ. So there's a couple of different ways you can get, uh, you can naturally get carbon into the crust. And we can think about maybe exploiting some of these ways uh, to store carbon there. Okay, there's three of these, um, well, really four of these reservoirs that I didn't talk about. There's um, plants and soils. Um, they are relatively minor players here. Soils can certainly hold some carbon, but not nearly as much as the crust or the ocean. Um, the atmosphere, obviously, we don't want to use that as a uh, carbon sequestration uh, reservoir because, you know, um, <laughs> We're kind of already doing that, and we, we want to move away from that. And then fossil fuels, um, you know, those, it's difficult to turn things into a fossil fuel over any kind of human time scale. So we're not going to worry about that so much. So to summarize the carbon cycle, um, carbon moves around through the crust, atmosphere, and ocean with a lot of stops along the way. And um, our anthropogenic activities have added a large flux of CO2 towards the atmospheric reservoir. And natural processes can only rebalance this on much longer time scale. Um, storing CO2 in the ocean acidifies the seawater, which is bad for the marine organisms. Um, and we have a tremendous storage potential in the crust, um, along with soil and biomass. And these represent some potential targets that we should look at moving forward. So next time, we'll get into the basics of carbon capture and talk about how we can prevent CO2 from getting into the atmosphere in the first place or try to capture what's already there. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next one.